Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, uh, today, we, the title for today's panel is uh, From the Microfactory to the Circular Economy. So we will talk about uh, the microfactory and uh, we'll also talk about how it can, I mean, how it will contribute to a vision for a circular economy. And uh, we have Robert Crocker, who is the Deputy Director of the China Australia Center for Sustainable, Urban De Sustainable Development. He is our moderator today, and he has moderated many panels for us uh, in the past. And what I love about Robert's panels is that the topics are usually really diverse. They're very different from each other. The last panel that he did for us uh, was about waste picking. If you have not watched any of those panels, please head to the video panel section of our website, and you will find them there. We, uh, Robert is going to talk to Veena Sahajwala today. She is an internationally recognized material scientist, engineer, inventor, and she's pretty much revolutionizing recycling science. I am sure they will have more to, uh, I mean, I'm sure Veena will tell you more about what she's up to and Robert will introduce this better. So before I hand this to them, just a reminder to everyone, uh, they will be taking questions live. So please use the Q&A section. Please put in your questions. I'm sure Veena and Robert will try their best to answer all the questions that you have. So over to you both. I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very uh, happy to be with Veena. Uh, um, I, I think, first of all, Veena, you should explain to our, our um, guests uh, how you got into this. You, you're a pyrologist, you're a material scientist, um, and uh, you've obviously been interested in wasted resources for a while, and I've been to your smart center and it's amazing. So would you like to tell them a little bit about your background and how you got into this and how you set up this center? Yeah, so. mm. Thanks, Rob. Thank you so much for the invitation to have a chat with you and with the audience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with the perspective that I bring in, and you're right, as a scientist as a, and as an engineer, um, you really, of course, get into a lot of detail in terms of how, you know, materials work, how processes work. So sometimes you can really get sort of very carried away into the mode of what might be considered the norm in a particular mm -hmm. field, in a particular discipline. But it was almost, for me, this sort of other side of my passion, which is I love to think about, you know, how we can in fact look at waste around us, look at the environment, look at the impact that we have caused as, as human beings. But to be able to then say, is there something we can also do that is much more positive? Um, mm -hmm. And how yes. do we actually create that positive impact? Um, and one thing was very evident. I mean, you know, as, as a scientist, myself as a material scientist uh, and as an engineer, I actually do then have the ability to say, why don't we look at the kinds of materials that everyone brands as a waste and is thrown away, causing a burden on our society, but how as an engineer I can bring that back into our, our desire as a society, as a global society to, to depend upon so many different types of products, whether it's our phones, our cars, our homes. So on one hand, materials and products are part of our everyday lives. But on the other hand, we had become to a large extent, and we still are, a society that's by nature quite disposable, if I can put it this yep. way, yep. are sort of almost this ability to take something, use it and throw it away, um, without stopping to think about, you know, the value that's embedded in, yes. in each and everything. Yes. Um, so your, your great, one of your great breakthroughs has been a few, um, was green steel. Do you want to just explain that and then we can talk a bit about micro factories? Yeah, mm. so. so green steel is basically a technology that uh, we've developed. The science was done at the University of New South Wales, um, research funded through the Australian Research Council, where we actually were able to show that using materials like waste tires um, as a raw material to replace some of the traditional coal and coke based materials in electric arc for the steel making was in fact completely possible. Mm -hmm. and, and it was possible because of the way we showed that scientifically, a lot of these materials did certain things under certain conditions. Yeah. And so the fact that you can have a high temperature steel making furnace, where you, know, you might have temperatures as high as 1,550 degrees Celsius, 
you're then using materials like waste tires to introduce them in that environment where what you want is chemical reactions so that the output steel is still generated by the furnace without causing any problems in the furnace operation. So green steel technology is all about breaking down, not burning these materials, but rather breaking down those complex molecules. So you can liberate small molecules of hydrogen, of CH4, of a lot of different types of gases that might contain carbon and hydrogen for the purpose of using it in the production of steel so that the output can still be generated, which is steel, and you can reduce the dependency on coal and coke in doing so. Hmm. That's great. Now, um, you came to our conference on uh, our seminar on um, transparency, particularly to talk about micro factories yeah. um, and the localization of dealing with a lot of waste, particularly polymers and some of these other nasties. Can you tell us a bit more about, uh, you know, I know, I know that you were working on um, turning polymer waste into building materials. Um, and then I guess from there, the idea was, well, what about trying to do it locally, trying to do it small scale? Would you like to talk a bit more about that issue of moving uh, to the local? Because in South Australia, for example, it's a big issue. We have huge distances. Mm. Yeah, so. yeah and, and you know, Rob, you hit the nail on the head. If you even pick up example of, you know, mm. the South Australian context, there's so many parts of the world where population might be distributed over, over really large distances. So if you can imagine where you might be in a remote community in a regional town somewhere, um, you can't always assume that you know, processing your waste, collecting your waste, you know, getting products in is going to be a straightforward issue. Mm -hmm. So you know, there are costs involved in logistics mm -hmm. and transport. Mm -hmm. And of course, most people will tell you that that is, that is expensive. So you can imagine if we were to be able to say that using again the materials that are part of what we are calling waste, but if you bring that back into our economy and if you can actually do that in a localized setting, then you've effectively created a circular economy solution that actually works quite nicely in a decentralized way. So that also it means that it allows you know, local communities, local businesses to actually look at in a way, what that circular economy means for that particular region. And I think that's important because ultimately, you know, our ability to process our waste materials mm. and do it in a way that is sustainable, that doesn't cause further pollution. You've got to be able to transform those waste materials into something that's value added, into something that's useful for our society. So the fact that, you know, we've shown you can take waste glass, waste textiles, and use that in the production of building products, like you know, putting it into uh, walling applications, putting it into flooring applications, but doing it in a way that you're not dependent necessarily on production happening somewhere else in some other part of the world yeah. and waiting yeah. for someone to send you 100 tiles because you want to refurbish your home. Yeah. So yeah. how do you actually achieve that in a local setting is by saying micro factories if they were in fact set up in various communities or smaller businesses and they were decentralized, then you can imagine that you've empowered communities, you've empowered regional towns, remote communities to actually say, you know what, if collectively we want to be able to manufacture products that are fit for our environment, because you know, if, if you know that temperatures are going to get really hot in a particular region and you might have pests and, and insects, you don't want to necessarily have materials that are prone to pest attack. Yeah, but you might yeah. say, you know, I've got a lot of waste glass, a lot of waste textiles. I can use, you know, new materials like that, mm -hmm. which are old because you've used it in one life. Yeah. Glass and yeah. textiles can be brought back to life again in a micro factory where it becomes part of your built environment and you can put it into building applications instead of relying on traditional tiles that are then manufactured somewhere else and then transported over long distances. So your micro factory is really about empowering local communities to manufacture products as much as possible within, within that region 
so that you can in fact create more jobs but you know more importantly you've dealt with the waste but you've also delivered something to your community that is that is needed in many instances affordable housing is something there's a, that everyone there's needs. a very interesting example i came across a few years ago of um, a group in the pacific islands who were using locals with 3d printers and uh, you know a kind of a plastic, a little lineup of m machines to take plastic waste, because their problem was the cost of shipping waste out of the island mm. was so high. So they thought they would turn that plastic waste into products they could sell back to the tourists. Mm. So in that way, creating that loop. So you have something like that in mind that for remote communities. Yeah, uh, yeah. look, absolutely. And, and we've, we've already been trialing some of these ideas with you know, a few of our industry partners who are based in, in small regional towns right. yeah. um, in New South Wales. And I think that's been really empowering for us also to be able to see how this can actually you know, come to life mm. in, in a realistic sense, because it's got to be practical, it's got to be doable, it's got to work within the context of that region. So we've got, um, you know, funded through the New South Wales State Government Circular Economy Innovation Network. Mm -hmm. And that innovation network is really all about facilitating, you know, businesses to work with local governments, to work with, you know, researchers and communities so that you actually can create, you mm -hmm. know, a solution that is fit for purpose. So I'd like to think about our solutions as something that is, about economies of purpose yeah, because yeah. it's about the purpose here which is delivering a solution um, and of course a small community can benefit from the fact that you know this way you can create jobs in the local community very much so mm -hmm. yeah i mean one of the challenges in remote australia Alice springs for example mm -hmm. uh, you know they do have some local recycling but there's an awful lot of trucks taking waste around South Australia mm -hmm. and I can be driving around and I'll see some waste truck and I'm thinking where's this guy going with this waste yeah. <laughs> yes. you know, and, and it's it's a um, it's not that uh, it's just that everything at the moment is set up to be centralized and I mm. think across America it's very similar you've got um, big cities like New York uh, pushing waste across the border um, to be place somewhere else where perhaps it's cheaper to get rid of it or you know mm. taking it out to the sea or you know there's yes there's a lot of inefficiencies and again we need to come back to this question of value which yes you you mentioned a lot in your your talk mm. so mm. would you like to talk a bit more about value because in a sense you're you're not saying downcycling like yes. putting things in roads you know buried in a road yeah you're, you're saying we can turn this waste into something perhaps of equal value or more. Mm, so, yes. Uh, and these yeah. are often nasty wastes as well. And I, and I think, you know, Rob, mm. the point about value is so important because you can think about value in so many different ways. It's not mm. just about mm. the economic side of it. Yes, that's the traditional way in which we have to create value. Mm. But, you know, by dealing with waste, by creating something that's useful in your society, uh, there is so much more in terms of the value that you can create because what you're really doing is you're serving a purpose in your community by enabling, for example, we've been talking about production of tiles or mm. production mm. of you know, products that you can put in your homes, um, which allow an end user, people like us, to be mm. able to say, you know what, I would rather use products that are made locally because that way I'm supporting the local economy. Mm -hmm. and, and so the value creation comes from the fact that you have to create something that, of course, people need, mm -hmm. but also see how by creating something that is sustainable, that is safe, mm -hmm. you know, people are, are actually feeling a lot more comfortable and confident. It's, it's actually knowing that the supply chain of your materials were all local. You yeah. know, so, for example, a farmer that we, you know, um, visited once in Dubbo, mm -hmm. You know, for him to be able to take the locally available wood waste uh, and use that as mm. part of some of the you know tiles and beautiful alternative wood-based you know mm. materials that you can use in your homes you know perfectly strong beautiful wood it was just basically leftover wood waste why would you not use that 
um, mm. in, in actually homes where you might say, well, in the local region, there's a lot of waste wood that's lying around uh, that can be utilized. Yes. So I think that was a really good example of how for, for this particular person, it was also another way of thinking, well, I'm already generating revenue from my primary sort of business. Mm. Mm. Now as a farmer, I can look at creating alternative you know, business opportunities. So when times are tough, as we know again in Australia, how many mm. you know, people who live off the land in, in the mm. agricultural That's sector right. have had so many difficulties. So the fact that you can actually look at alternative you know, ways to generate revenue. Yeah. Uh, we had dairy women up in uh, the northern part of New South Wales, again visiting, uh, visiting them, uh, that they've got a lot of plastic waste uh, from silage wrap. Yeah. And yeah. that was again an example of whether it's natural or synthetic materials, it's part of our lives. Whether you're on a farm or whether you're in the city, the ability to actually think about creating value from the waste that you have actually then is changing the mindset because you don't have to always think of it as, oh gosh, I need a waste service company or I need to just chuck it somewhere uh, mm. or bury it in landfill, but rather, you know, working in a collaborative manner and creating something valuable. So what about, um, I'll just pour some water. <laughs> Uh, what about um, uh, taking your silage, silage wrap example, mm. um, you know, a plastic that, um, you know, is uh, nearly everywhere in the agriculture sector. So if you set, were going to set up a micro factory um, using, say, silage wrap, you would presumably want to know what could be made that mm -hmm. was, um, you know, with it. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, bricks or something, you know, that uh, you could make with it. I guess the, um, uh, the, the problem is trying to fit um, the material to some purpose and to do it within a local economy is quite, quite challenging sometimes. And, and I yeah. think this is why we have to think about it as a collaborative economy. Yeah. So, you know, you might say, look, I mean, the town next door, which might be 100 kilometres away, yeah. has got capability to process that. So not everything has to be done in one place. Everybody cannot be an expert in everything. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to say, let's work with, you know, your local towns, your local communities that might be a few hundred kilometers away. Mm -hmm. And therefore let's look at the possibilities of how we can work together. So some of that plastic could well be an input into a, a small micro factory that the, the town next door has. Yeah, um, yeah. And vice versa, if the town next door has got, you know, oversupply of, you know, agricultural or, or wood waste, um, and you can process that in your town mm -hmm. or waste glass or whatever the case might be. So it's again recognizing that micro factories are decentralized enough that they are able to be also fairly collaborative in nature. Because after all, if there are two or three communities and towns, that are able to help each other, then it is a collaborative economy in, in, a, in a bigger sense. You know, we talk about the shared economy, we talk about a lot of new ways of thinking about how yeah. we can actually help each other. So I think to me, the time has come for us to think, right, if we, if we can imagine this way of thinking, where you might have decentralized micro factories that are operating, mm -hmm. someone might specialize in e-waste plastics Somebody else might specialize in plastics that are coming out from the farm. They so, could be completely different products. So what about working, let, let's talk specifically about the components of a micro factory. I mean, I've tried here to play around with demonstrators for how you might recycle plastic. Yeah. But it's very basic sort of thing that, to show children you know, mm. how plastics is recycled. Yeah. But you're talking about technology that I would probably not even understand. So would you like to walk us through some of these, sure. um, some of these technologies that you, you're envisaging in this micro factory? Yeah, so, so micro factories, uh, for example, the ones that we're running mm. at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, you know, we have had now two of them. We've launched mm. our e-waste micro factory um, two years ago, and mm. last year we launched a plastics micro factory. So you can appreciate that within a space of about 100 square uh, meters, mm. what we have shown and, and the one that I'm talking about, it runs in the basement of 
the building where you actually visited us. And I was very proud to be there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess for us, it also is about saying that, you know, we do recognize that when we talk about plastics or glass, they're not all the same. So you can't just bundle all the plastics into one category and say, right, this is where I'm just going to process all my plastics because it's not possible. You can have plastics that are there in cars, which are going to be different to plastics that you might have in your electronic waste. You know, so you can start to then put even in the broader category of plastics saying, all right, well, I can actually create some types of plastics that may well be fit for manufacturing, for instance. Mm -hmm. so, to, so to respond to what you can do in terms of manufacturing, what we've shown is that you can create plastic filaments mm -hmm. that are made predominantly out of waste plastics. Those plastic filaments can then become part of the manufacturing supply chain because you can feed them into 3D printers yeah. and you can yeah. then use that as a feedstock and print objects and print products that you need. So you can imagine that, you know, if we were in the business of repair economy, yeah. uh, then yeah. you certainly would always need to print spare parts and components. So you can then start to extend that analogy and talk about, mm -hmm. you know, do we have access to a lot of waste plastics? Um, well, that's a very difficult, difficult. You mentioned in your talk that mm. today, that um, yesterday, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> been going a long time here, uh, that you uh, were confident that you could uh, recycle or reuse plastics that are rejected for recycling. Yeah. And uh, some of them have perhaps toxics or, you know. Um, and this is why, of course, you know, you can't assume all plastics will be recycled in exactly yeah, the same way. Yeah, that's right. Because you've got to understand, and that's why I made that very important point about knowing what yeah. those materials are. Yeah. So that once yeah. you know what those materials are in your plastics, you need to then work with experts mm. so that you can process your materials in the correct way. So no. it's not just about plastics. It could no. be about so many other materials. I mean, a lot of people know about PVCs, right? No. So no. PVC, which of course is polyvinyl chloride, mm -hmm. um, vinyls, a lot of these materials can potentially release dioxins. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't want to be processing PVC in a mixture of some of the other types of plastic where, you know, you want to be able to create products and PVC will just become a contaminant. Mm -hmm. So of course, understanding all these different types of plastics is important so that you can say, look, I will process PVC in a completely different way. So I don't mm. release harmful pollutants, but there are many plastics that may be perfectly fine. I mean, our standard PET water bottles, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. these are, everybody knows, recyclable through traditional technologies. Yeah. So where you've got traditional technologies, where you want to be able to create from electronic waste, um, like our printers, our modems, and so on, you can actually use a lot of that plastic, and you can then create, as we've shown in our micro factory, that you can create these plastic filaments. Um, and that, in its own right, is a value-added product. Yeah. Because right now, if you want to do 3D printing, you yeah. have to go and purchase plastic filaments. So no, it's, it's pretty it's, insane. It, I know, it's, and and, and <laughs> people, consumers pay good money. To go I, purchase. I, I've come across recyclers who've been importing uh, clean plastics yes. into Australia to create recycled plastic logs for industry. For, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, I think, well, don't we have enough of our own? You know, it's, um, <laughs> which, is, which is, you know, exactly right. You know, sometimes when you actually start looking, you find mm -hmm. some just crazy things going on because you yeah. think, yeah, well, yeah. well, everyone's got enough you know, waste plastics, if you've got technological solutions that recognize it's not one size fits all, mm. there are different solutions for different materials. Um, and in some instances, you know, like in waste glass, if you don't have a glass smelter um, that can actually take, you know, mm. glass waste that is available as we're seeing in Australia, then you've got an oversupply of waste glass. Now, does that mean that glass is of no use? Of course not. But the examples of our glass-based and textile-based tiles that we've created, we've done that again in our own micro factory. Using glass and textile. Using glass and textiles. Really yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, in, yeah. in an instance like that, um, if anything, we're actually saying that you don't need a smelter to do that. 
Right. So in fact, the other benefit of producing products that are manufactured at a lot lower temperature yeah. means that you've automatically reduced the carbon footprint, the energy intensity of those. And the risk. And yes. the risk. I mean, and yeah. that has gone That's down. Right. Yeah. And, and we're talking to, of course, furniture designers yeah. and producers who are really excited about some of these products. Um, and it's opening up that imagination on behalf of that whole manufacturing sector. Um, furniture is something that, you know, big and small producers can make. And if people love the notion of having... Um, you know, beautiful colors yes. that you can embed into your glass by using waste textiles. You can just unleash your imagination and say your local micro factory could actually make products, you know, based on the textiles that you're interested in using that brings in your personal sort of touch to it. There's a bit of that personalization, um, but also importantly, it reflects on that local region. Yes. That's very, very good. And I, I was also thinking, um, I know we've been going all day, it's been a long day, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, the circular economy, um, one of the problems is that we're putting things in at the beginning, which is not, not necessarily good for recycling, not necessarily good as waste. Mm. You know, we, we brought up the issue of toxics in the talks yeah. today. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mentioned PVC on stickers on fruit, for example. Yes. They go through any filters, end up in the soil. Not a good idea. Mm. Um, you know, so, so in a sense, is it possible to sort of have a wish list that we put to governments that, you know, looking at the larger scale, say we, we don't want things out of these materials? Mm. With e-waste, it's particularly apparent because with e-waste, we're still using glues, you know, screws. How do we take e-waste apart safely in these micro, micro factories? Yes, yeah, so one of the things that we're developing, um, and this is something that, um, you know, again, we've, we've shown in a micro factory that it's, it's feasible, um, is the use of um, technology that's called fragmentation. So you can actually... Yeah have you know, your, your glass, your circuit boards and plastics, you know, if you're thinking about a phone, for instance, yeah, and yeah. you can literally pull that apart. So in fact, in, in some of the work that we've done, and we've shown that it mm. is actually feasible. And if you can do that in a nice, clean way, you mm. can actually then imagine that you can take away that glass or plastic or circuit board. Okay. And yeah. then you can start to think about value addition and value creation. Yeah. Um, again, in a micro factory, because you can you can think about a local, you know, small regional community that's able to do that, um, and they don't need large volumes no, of no, phones no. to to make it happen. No. So, in a small setting, you could be a small, you know, operator who could offer that as a service, and mm. you know, perhaps it could be something that governments could support. Mm. Is have yeah. micro factories in in a few towns, so people can actually, I mean, we, we already have collection centers run by yes. councils and so on. So you, it's not too far out in the sense of imagining that where our products are in fact being collected, mm -hmm. that somewhere close by is a micro factory that's also able to process it and add value. You know, the last thing you want is to take bulky, you know, electronic waste or whatever bulky products which have got plastics and everything else inside, and then transport that, because if, if half of it inside is air, well, you're just transporting <laughs> you know, know. Uh, air inside. So you know, you all, it makes sense from a logistics point of view yeah. that yeah. you can, in fact, isolate plastics and metallic components, mm. process them as much as possible locally, you know, do that value creation. It doesn't have to be the finished product. It's got to be a value-added product. It's a create. very revolutionary concept because everything is set up for scale, large mm. scale. Mm. You know, the, the, um, uh, if you look at any of these materials, mm. you're often looking at very large operators, multinationals you know, who take steel, take glass, take other things, that, then plastics. Mm. Um, E-waste uh, you know, traditionally has been shipped to certain places, then broken up, often using robots or very, uh, you know, some, in some parts of the world, very poor people mm. know, doing dangerous work. Yeah. And that's been a real concern to me. 
Um, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely so. right. And I think this is why, in a way, having you know affordable solutions is important exactly you know it's yes. no point telling somebody oh yeah you know you can fix this problem you just need a billion dollars to set up a smelter or something right yeah. it's not yeah. going to happen so part of the reason why i've been really motivated right from the early days uh when i was thinking about how do we actually translate that science into practice yeah that means each of these engineered modules when we talk about scalability yeah. We have to be prepared to talk about scalability as in going up and down the scalability ladder. Yeah. That means you should be able to have your engineered modules of these micro factories that are still small enough and you can design them to be small enough. And that's exactly what we do at UNSW is when people challenge us. You know, we've had, mm. you know, community and, and, you know, local government places that have said, oh, we'd love to be able to have one of these filament makers that you have, we just want it to be very tiny because we just want it as a little demonstration unit. Yeah. So I think yeah. for us, it's been very good. The fact that people are using that imagination to say that we can process these materials in a safe manner, in a sustainable manner. Um, but the other important features in an affordable manner. Well, that's right. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess when we talk about affordability, what sort of figures are we talking about with Talking about 100 square meters. Yeah, that's that's um, roughly the space you know, we're looking at. Some some of my neighbours have sheds that big. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we always talk about. That you know, what the scheme of things. Um, yeah. You know, when people sort of, no matter where you are, um, you know, warehouses are usually that big. I mean, we we uh, right. one of the small operators who we're working with in a small community, um, you know, uh, called Kudamandra in, in a town not too so sort of far away from Canberra. Um, you know, for, for him, what was really exciting is that, um, you know, everyone was, ex you know, really passionate about it. Of course, our main sort of contact there uh, with someone like Andrew, who we've known for a while, um, who, of course, was motivated and passionate about it. So that from his point of view, um, you know, he knew he could make it work. Yes. So it wasn't yes. just about, you know, what is it going to cost me to buy this, but also importantly to have the confidence to say, you know, I need to buy these engineered modules, of course, mm. something that we design and show him how to operate and help him yeah. set up. Okay. And of course, that's yeah. important. So you're, you're actually commercializing these. Yes, yes, indeed. You're indeed. selling these modules. So we, we don't actually sell the modules. No. We okay. actually, we provide this as a solution. Yeah. So that for someone who, you know, wants to deploy micro factories, yeah. for them, it's really about saying, right, you know, we basically take on a license. Yeah. to operate yeah. a micro oh, okay. Okay. So the license to operate, of course, from our perspective is important because we also want to, you know, work with those people who are keen to see this as a journey, as yeah. a collaborative journey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are going to be constantly developing this. And of course, as much as possible, our micro factory, you know, operators and people who are micro factory activators it so reminds me a bit of citizen science, this, because yeah. you're, you're in fact taking people from the community mm. and you're, uh, in a sense, uh, training them, helping them to understand the waste system in, in miniature or at scale. Yes, yes. And uh, also providing them with the opportunity to um, create a new, new resources from mm. It's a really nice way to put it, Rob, because... <laughs> citizen, citizen science, citizen engineering. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Citizen engineering. I love so, it. Because I, I guess you're right. I mean, in a way for us, it is so important that we're not going to be there. Um, mm. We also want to make sure that any of the solutions that we develop, you know, our Circular Economy Innovation Network, as an example of how we are facilitating that journey um, on circular economy for most people, um, you know, it is about a journey. Everybody wants to do it. And different people are at different stages in that journey. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the fact that everyone has to start with, you know, absolutely a blank piece of paper in many mm -hmm. instances. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people have already been collecting different types of waste resources. So it's about saying, well, okay, if someone's already in the business of collecting and aggregating mm -hmm. from their local communities, you know, that next step up in terms of, you know, and I'll use the term citizen engineering. For us, it's about coming in and helping, helping various businesses do that. So in this case, it also means that it is a collaborative effort. We do expect that, you know, not everyone will want to be an operator. 
we, yeah. we totally would understand yeah. that because for yeah. a lot of people, this will sound very challenging to be able to operate engineered modules, but you don't have to do it yourself. And this is why yeah. I always talk yeah. about this as a collaborative economy, yeah. because you could be somebody who's got an interest in collecting, you already might have a business, but you might find that there is an, an operator of a micro factory mm. and you might want to partner with them. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's Excellent. very much about thinking about, you know, what is it that you can do at a certain point in time, whether you're, you know, a local community or a small mm -hmm. local business, mm -hmm. and to be able to make that happen in a collaborative manner. So micro factories, or someone who is looking at it as a business, and you want mm -hmm. to activate micro factories, or whether you then want to partner with a micro factory operator, um, mm -hmm. all of these are part and parcel of what I would call, you know, supply chains that in a way are very different to the, a traditional supply chain that people think about vertical integration. Yeah. I'd like to call this as a lateral integration. It's more of a network. Yes, yes. 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 So that Sorry. lateral integration means that you can literally cut across traditional boundaries yes. um, yeah. and work with partners, your industry partners and collaborators with whom you might actually have never thought about. Like, you know, yeah. someone who's got waste glass and someone who's got waste textiles, you might actually want to collaborate. And in a normal situation, those two parties would probably have never thought about collaborating or working together. It's very, it's very interesting because when I was younger, I went to Italy and I met some famous designers, but I was looking at factories and how that they would subcontract. Mm. And um, I was amazed because the designers would have lunch with the factory owners. Yeah. And um, somebody would say, oh, I've got this friend who has a machine that bends plate glass. And somebody would say, oh, well, what about if we make glass furniture? Yeah. So there would be this collaboration, yes. which uh, at the time was pretty unique in, to Italy. Yeah, now right. it's, it spreads more and more people are doing this. Yes. So in a sense, you're, um, I, I was going to ask you about the role of design in this, mm. because it's no good if somebody out there in Kudamandra makes a product that nobody wants. You know, um, absolutely. There's plenty of examples of this around the world. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. Ah, look, so, absolutely, Rob. And in fact, uh, you know, to become an example of an industry partner who you know builds beautiful furniture in Adelaide, um, Spark is the name of the company. Oh, yes. and, yeah. and you know, again, for for someone like Cameron, who again I met in. I think must have been at one of these events uh, oh, somewhere. Right. Okay. Yeah, you, you sort of think, well, this is how collaborations start. Yeah. And yeah. for me, it was really nice to hear that as somebody who's been in the furniture business for a long time, but took the time and trouble to come to UNSW, see it for himself, mm. and give us that feedback that this is fabulous product that consumers would love it. And likewise, we've had many other designers who've come in and have expressed an interest and given us their feedback. It's almost quite interesting that, you know, they've come in and seen some of these things from their own lenses yeah. and, and yeah. have then thought about how from their design lenses that we might be making tiles and we might just call them tiles, for example, yeah. a glass textile, yeah. but they can see so much more that could yes. be manufactured with it. So I absolutely agree. There is a very important role to be played on behalf of designers, yeah, manufacturers, yeah. you know, recyclers. I think this is why it's such a beautiful example of that collaborative economy. Yes. And therefore, what we are doing in working together is we are creating that collaborative impact that we know that individually we can't do it. But if we can do it in a collaborative manner, yes. it's a win-win outcome for everyone. And I think the issue of transparency, of course, can, we've been talking about transparency for a day and a half. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> uh, transparency comes into this because uh, the very big centralized industries, often there's a lack of transparency, which can cause problems. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard the paper about, um, uh, powder, coated, coaters and powder coating and very hard to know what's in the, in the powder because it's, you know, Commercial confidence. Yes, top secret. <laughs> top secret. Yeah. Yes. Um, nice colors, but top secret. Yeah. So I guess, you know, from our point of view, you're looking at um, drilling down into this material mm -hmm. so that you have a really good handle on what's actually in the box. Yeah. And, and that, to me, is a critical moment to start this journey 
wrong because mm. people like me who have no maths, no science, can't drill down into a box on my own, even if I was running a big company. You know, so it's, <laughs> it's very important to yes. have that scientific evidence yes. to, from where you start the journey. Mm. And so when you involve the community, you need, uh, in a sense, to have that ongoing collaboration. Yeah, so. Yes, indeed. And, and I guess this is why, of course, the role of science and engineering can never be underestimated. You, know, no, you have nice. to be able to say, if I don't have enough knowledge myself about the materials, about the products, that's okay. I can actually collaborate with others. And in doing so, you're actually you know, making sure that in that collaborative manner and in a lateral integrated sort of style, you're actually looking across the, the traditional boundaries, yes. you're saying, right, you know, is there somebody in the furniture space who might really be able to use this product that I've made? The guy who's making furniture, of course, has to try and test it um, and to be able to say whether this is something, one, whether customers would like it, like we're saying, you know, it's got to be designed beautifully, uh, but also for the, the producer, the, the manufacturer, for instance, has to know whether it's, it's a material with which they can work. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's not enough to say, here's a tile now, if you go make, make a beautiful piece of furniture, but they've got to be able to work with it. Mm -hmm. So what are the properties? You know, can you clean the surface easily? You know, just sometimes it could be simple things like that, yeah. that, yeah. you know, someone who's been in the business for a long time will look at it from that lens. And, that's, and I think, again, to me, it's very important that we have that ability to collaborate so that to some extent, I think we can challenge each other. Yes, but I think in yes. doing so, what we will probably be doing is challenging the norm. Yes. And yes. I think to me, that's the only way we'll bring about change yeah. is by challenging the norm and saying, you know what, there is actually a better solution that we need to find that better solution. Just because we don't know how to recycle something or manufacture something out of a waste resource doesn't mean it can't be done. Mm -hmm. This is where we bring in the power of you know, science and engineering and technology to underpin and provide that foundation to designers, to manufacturers, um, and, and to our community. Um, mm -hmm. You know, communities mm -hmm. want to know, um, which is back to your seminar topic of transparency. Yes. And I think yes. the more people know, um, I, I think to me it's no different to talking about, you know, food. Yeah, and, that's you right. Know, where they want to know. They food. want to know about they food. Want to know about food. And I think <laughs> the more we start to have yeah. this conversation yeah. about about products that we use, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's about taking into account um, the ethics, the sustainability, you mm -hmm. know, safety, a lot of questions that are in there. But I think it's not a bad thing to be, you know, asking those questions and learning from your, your colleagues, your family, your friends, so we can all really lift standards in our society in terms of what we all would like the future planet to yes. indeed look like. Yes, well, I, I went to an interesting uh, place in China called Jeshu. It's a little town, it used to be very poor. It has about 40,000 people in recycling. And what they've done is, in a way, forced a giant version of what you're talking about. Mm. They, they put together factories that do recycling. Mm -hmm. So plastics, glass, um, I think uh, batteries, mm. you know, but uh, some of it, Fairly tricky stuff to mm -hmm, handle, like mm -hmm. lead batteries. Yes. But, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I'm not sure, if we seem to have quite a lot of people chatting here. So, um, Hey, uh, so Robert, a... questions have come in as well. You can open the Q&A section and we have a bunch of questions there. Ah, gosh. I'm afraid this is not an apple, so I can't enlarge it very much. Um, uh, do you want me to read the questions out or uh, well, maybe if you could would you like to be the editor you could because i can't see them very clearly from here that's, that's <laughs> okay I, i'm gonna tell you we have a question from biswajit uh, debna who's asking how microfactories can help to valorize printed circuit boards without losing the resources yes um very good question and uh, certainly with printed circuit boards we've got lots of you know high quality metals that are present. So one of our micro factories is about producing value-added alloys. Um, and I'd certainly encourage people to have a look at the Smart Centers website. 
Um, there's, there's some beautiful sort of uh, video clips that actually explain that in a little bit more detail, but it's about saying that what you are doing is using printed circuit boards as a resource for a lot of these metals, which then allow you to create um, value added alloys um, from that. And I'm sure it's cheaper than digging it out of the ground. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's the thing, right? At the micro level, when you start to do the, um, I guess, you know, economics of it. But so absolutely with Smart Center's website, um, you know, we, we certainly will be able to look at a few things there that, that help people understand that a little bit better if, if someone's interested in jumping on Smart at UNSW's website. We can, we can send you the links better if you like, yeah. Yeah, but we will put out the links. I'll get the links from Robert and it'll be there up on our website, so. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Cecilia has uh, put out a bunch of uh, questions. She says, first of all, she says a big hug to Robin Lena. And <laughs> then, uh, she, huh? then she's asking, what are the perspectives in design responsibility besides the one furniture company that you consider? I'll, I'll let Rob take that design, one. Design, sorry, the design responsibility. Uh, I didn't quite catch the last of it. What are perspectives in design responsibility besides the one furniture company that you could consider? Ah, uh, well, I think design, um, the, the beauty of this concept is, in my understanding, is to reduce the very large scale of resource management, recycling at the moment, and to put it in one place, one smaller place, so that it would be possible to, for example, uh, using the kind of technology at the moment that we use in ceramics, you know, and uh, in glass production. Um, so really the, the imagination is the limit, and uh, I'm sure designers would come up with some interesting things, for example, lighting. Mm. lighting systems uh you know you might have somebody working in lighting already who might mm. be interested in this um and uh you know in terms of building materials we talked a little bit about mm. uh, um one of one of the things that i'm particularly happy with for the uh, i'm particularly excited about this is at the moment if you buy um, a tap for your kitchen you have no idea where it's come from. Mm. It could have been made by slaves mm. somewhere. You right. just don't know because the, uh, the distances in these supply chains are often so long and so complicated. It's very, very hard to verify, them, which is why we're now here in the university talking about blockchain as a way of securing yeah. you know, some, some information, you know, um, going back down these, these pathways. But, with a micro factory, you've got presumably you're shrinking the scale and the, the scope um, and turning out little local networks. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. a beautiful summary of that, Rob. So the idea is really as much as possible, mm. localize it and the ability to have that traceability in something means that you can literally go back and say, well, actually it was produced by that micro factory in that location. Um, and I think that's really the beauty of doing something in a local manner. And in fact, you know, hopefully it also means that you incorporate local features into it. Um, might be local colors, local designs. And, and I think to me, it's a nice way to, to capture the story in products, yes, yes. Um, which, which I think every designer would love to do that. If you're from a local region, you want to be able to do that. So what we are looking at is through our circular economy network and, and with, with the things that we've been talking about is if we show something works successfully in one place, that should really be an inspiration for others to say this can be done. So it's about replicability. And yes, when we talk about a furniture maker somewhere in Adelaide, we can also work with another furniture maker somewhere else. So I think all of this then suddenly becomes, um, you know, pieces of inspiration. Yes. That yes. these are meant to be there so that others can look at it and go, right, okay, I can see that in that particular town, um, you know, they're processing it in a certain way in that small scale. My town is really as small as what they are. Mm. I think I can do this as well. So I think part of this is very much about, as much about all of us inspiring each other, but also, you know, looking at how it can be replicated um, 
you know, all over. So, so one other potential benefit would be separation because mm. at the moment, um, and I'm sure Cecilia would agree with me, um, hi Cecilia, that <laughs> uh, you know, one of the great problems is that we can't get people to separate because what they're throwing away is supposedly valueless. Mm. See, and in, in right. you're talking about circular economy, you're saying that actually this is potentially valuable. Yes. Um, and uh, you're not talking about tiny amounts of value. You're talking about potentially with, with e-waste. Well, with e-waste, of course, gold, you know, you, you know, can, so, yeah. You know, so, so I think that's the thing, right? I mean, mm. whereas so far, if you put all of it under this category of, well, it's all a waste, yeah. then of yeah. course, like you say, we, we can't even begin to attribute value. No, so I think part right. of it is also around value depends on what you're, of course, transforming it into. Yeah. So our ability to carry out that transformation of waste into a resource mm. means we're automatically saying we've attributed a value to it because that is a useful resource for our society. Mm. Um, and in the future, we'll have to make decisions. You know, if something cannot be transformed into mm. a resource over and over again, you actually then have to stop and ask the question, should we be making that in the first place? And I think this is where we'll start to shift because once people start to see the, the whole, the whole picture, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly right. I mean, uh, we have somebody here in our science, you probably know them, who's been working on aeroplane um, aluminium, very difficult to recycle. Mm -hmm. um, there's, all over the world, there are sort of graveyards of aeroplanes. People don't know what to do with them. Mm. There's a resource. Yes, so, yes, <laughs> indeed. And, yeah. you know, I mean, this is the whole point, yeah. right? I mean, mm. we really have to either find a way forward yeah. or if something is really that people feel, look, I mean, you know, this is really toxic and it can't be done. I mean, it's, it's the equivalent question of, you know, lead. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, we have to ask the question. Uh, there's a reason why, of course, it's so difficult to process something like lead because of the fact that, you know, it is a, it is a toxic material. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, yeah. in doing so, we have to be very careful in the way we process it. Yeah. And not everyone can do it. So, you know, we have to be able to also recognize that there will always be some difficult materials, some challenging materials. Um, and in society, if we can understand what that is, mm -hmm. um, then of course it, it makes it easier for everyone to collectively go, okay, well, you know, here is this difficult material. There are some specialists who can deal with it. Mm. Let's leave that up to the specialist. But where it's possible to be done with materials that are reasonably common, we've talked about glass, for example, mm. and textiles, mm. you can actually take that. But these are materials that are there in most parts of the world. You know, people are using products, you know, whether it's glass or, or textiles. So I think to me again, you know, and textiles are not just the clothes that we wear. No, they are, they are no. textiles that are used. Seats uh, covering everything. Those, everything, yeah. These walls are cork actually. Yeah, we have a few more questions. So should I go over the next one? Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, we have Syed Hassan whose question is energy demand for micro factories seems to be quite high. If so, how would the new products compare with the traditionally manufactured product? Yes, yeah, so actually with energy requirements, you've got to always look at, um, you know, at what temperatures you are processing these materials. So if I pick up on something like glass, traditional glass melting is actually done um, at temperatures that are 1000 degrees Celsius and above, right? So You've got to really be able to say if micro factories were making products that were operating at much lower temperatures, then of course the energy requirements are much lower. So what you're really doing is you're making products under the conditions that are required for that particular application. Not all glass requires smelting. So this is where of course you've got to be very clever in the way you pick the right kind of processing conditions so that we can respond to the needs of the product that you're manufacturing. And this is why, of course, it's like saying, you know, if you're going to be making different types of products, um, you don't assume that it's one size fits all. Um, we have shown that in our micro factories for making these glass textile 
uh, flat products, the panels and the tiles that I was talking about, the temperatures are a lot lower. So absolutely, you can imagine a future where micro factories are quite unique in the way they operate. They don't have to replicate traditional conventional processes. So the, so the energy requirements will obviously be lower if you're operating at much lower temperatures. Uh, okay, the next question is from Moritz Gold. Uh, they want to know, recycling at large happens when it's financially viable. A, loss of a lot of waste types cannot be recycled uh, from a financial perspective because they are mixed waste or comprised of so many materials. What's the way out? Yes, yeah, so look, I mean, first thing, you know, of course, you know, that's, that's the core element. If you're going to be designing and developing technologies and solutions, you've got to think about the long-term viability. And long-term viability mm -hmm. means you've got to bring in environmental as well as economic viability, technical viability. The product is actually something that's genuinely durable and long-lasting. You can effectively show that it makes economic sense to actually install some of these products. And then if you're saying, all right, what happens to the end of life of those? Can it go back into the same micro factory for reprocessing again? Can it be incorporated into the process? So again, it's thinking about these questions that we talked about. It's about evaluating and constantly working towards that science and engineering that says, if you've got a mixed you know, case scenario that we're talking about here, what kind of products and what kind of manufacturing processes will allow you to take that mixture into consideration? The answer is not always, oh, it can't be done, but you have to be able to then refine your process to respond to the changing demands of different types of feedstock that you're getting. I think also with packaging, um, you know, combining materials uh, can sometimes be very difficult mm. for the recycler, um, you know, particularly combinations of aluminium, plastics, paper, etc. Yeah. So, I mean, in a way, um, there must be probably solutions that we can find, but uh, we have to ask, well, can't we design things better Absolutely. <laughs> so that we don't have these We problems. don't have these problems. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. that's why it will keep challenging us as we do this. Mm. If this becomes front and center of our minds. Yeah. Yeah. then when certain things become so obviously like, why are we making this yeah. in the first place? Yeah. So I think to me, you're right. It's yeah. Like glass, for example, is a fantastic uh, product. Um, you know, the, the idea that we should waste it mm. is it, so bad to me, so bad, yeah. you know, yeah. because sand is becoming more and more scarce. Yeah. You know, it's, um, mm. yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We should be, we should be recycling it, reforming it. You know, over and over again. Yeah, if it means right. we need different product solutions, different technologies, so be it. Yeah. But I think it's too good to waste. It's too good to waste. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, do you think we have time for one last question? Because we're nearly getting done with yeah. the hour. Yeah. So I'll just. Uh, we have another question from Cecilia. Citizen engineering sounds important. But what about citizens design and designers? How to activate citizen design? That's the yeah, look, I mean, you know, the, the reason why in a way I really like that citizen engineering is because ultimately when we talk about creating value added products, it's everything we've talked about. Engineering has to be something that needs to be done because you can't design something and then put it out into the market and consumers love the look of it. But actually, from its engineering point of view, it doesn't meet the requirements for a particular application. So to me, once you can, you can actually do the engineering and you can say, right, okay, here's a product that fulfills the properties that are needed. You know, so if you want to be able to put it into flooring tiles and uh, for instance, you know, it needs to have certain strength. Now, yes, once you've done that, you've said, right, I'm satisfied that this product manufactured in a certain way um, is suitable for a particular application. It's no point making something that then falls apart very quickly. So, Built on that foundation, I think to me, um, what I liked about citizen engineering is that can then draw upon and pull together other elements of design. And I think then the collaboration can build on that foundation. Because once you've got something that works in a manufacturing sense, you can then say, right, now I need to pull in designers. And, and vice versa, designers can come to engineers and say, 
look, you've, you're operating a microfactory. Can you possibly make something like this form? I think, I think often designers have very clever solutions that will come out of their observations of a process mm. or a material, mm. uh, you know, which um, can be quite striking. And, um, uh, you know, I mentioned that story about the glass furniture. Um, yes. You know, a machine that bends plate glass to an engineer might be something you do in a building. <laughs> it might not be something you make chairs out of. Yes. And in Italy at that time, they put one in New York wow. about six months later. So mm. it really happened. Mm. Um, you know, but, and it looked amazing. I didn't think it would be very comfortable, but it looked amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you see, that, that, but that sort of thing added huge value mm. to that particular process. So I, I can imagine design playing a very important collaborative role. Absolutely. So in a sense, it changes uh, the role of the designer mm. because the designer, in a sense, is uh, perhaps influencing the engineer and the engineer is influencing the designer and the, the manufacturer is influencing both. So, yes. Well, I can't do that. Yes. <laughs> or I can. Or uh, I can, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and I so think that's really the key message, isn't it? In a collaborative manner. Collaborative we can, economy. We yes, can create yes. that collaborative economy that we've been talking mm. about because you know we all it shows all these disciplines do need each other. They do. Science, that's the engineering, right. design, yeah. um, and I think to me perhaps that's what's been missing in the past yeah. Um, yeah. that we have not done enough of you know cutting across those boundaries and talking to each other across boundaries. So mm. I think to me perhaps mm. this will you know get more and more designers and engineers excited about you know, talking to each other and saying, you know, can we actually both sides help each other? Because if we yeah. have a common goal yeah. of creating more sustainable products with more recycled content in it, you know, we, we need both engineers and designers to work yeah. together yeah. to make That's it happen. Right. Uh, and once we do that, anything is possible. Yeah, I remember Duncan Baker-Brown, um, who I interviewed on uh, one of these sessions, he he had a tile made out of oyster shells right. from restaurants in London. Right. They have a huge surplus of oyster shells. Right. And uh, <laughs> it's a very good cement tile. Because yeah. It's got all the elements yes. of cement. You know? Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. So there's uh, the sky's the limit. The the issue really is we we producing too much stuff. So yes. The, yes. The economics of that is. Probably beyond this discussion, but it's a very interesting discussion. <laughs> but anyway, I hope uh, you've really enjoyed uh, our conversation. Sveta, is there anything else you want from, from us now? Uh, oh, no, I think we'll, we'll, we'll overshot the hour. So if you want to like close the session and then hand it to me, I, I'm fine with that. Yeah. No, we, we, um, uh, we've been, we, I should explain it's half past seven and uh, we've been at this for a day and a half now. So we've been 12 hours, I think, on the job. So yeah. it's probably time to stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you both. I mean, you've had like a very busy two days and uh, I'm really happy that you actually could take time out for this. And uh, thank you all who've attended the panel. We will, uh, sh whatever links that Robert and Lena talked about, we will be sharing it with you as well. So thanks a lot. I hope you both have a good dinner and a good uh, evening. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. And thanks a lot. And apologies to the questioners I couldn't answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.